All right, we're live. Great. So hello, everyone. Welcome to Nova Education's first virtual field trip of 2020. My name is Gina Veramo. I'm the outreach manager at Nova, and I'll be your host for this virtual field trip. So thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you. This is just All the right. We're live. This is just the first Great. in a so series. Oh, oh, I'm Thanks. hearing myself. Welcome to Nova Education's first. <laughs> this is. <laughs> It's gone. Um, this is the first in a series of virtual field trips across our newest project, Polar Extremes. So Polar Extremes takes viewers on a quest to the polar extremes of our planet, the Arctic and the Antarctic, to discover how Earth's climate has changed over deep time and how studying our past can help predict our climate future. So our guest today is featured in the Nova Polar Lab, which is a web-based interactive that you can play right now. And it allows students to join scientists on their quest to understand why the poles are key to understanding Earth's climate. So Christo Beisert is an associate geology and geophysics professor and senior researcher at Oregon State University. And he's here to tell you about his research analyzing ice cores from the Arctic and the Antarctic to piece together what Earth's climate looked like about a million years ago. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it off to our speaker, Christo. Okay. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. It's such a pleasure to see all of you here today. And what we're going to do today is first, I'll talk a little bit about ice cores and the kind of things we can learn by studying these ice cores. And then we're going to go downstairs into the basement, into our freezer, where we store our ice core samples. And I'll show you how we cut an ice core sample. We'll actually look at the bubbles inside the ice. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we do these measurements. And then after that, we'll just have your questions. Does that sound good to everybody? Perfect, okay. I'm gonna share my screen here. I have an, a little presentation prepared. Let's see if it works. Um, can you see me? Can you see my screen? Can I get a top thumbs up if you can see my screen? Can't see it. You cannot see it. No, we can't see it yet. Okay. Oh, can there you, you go. You're starting it. Can we can you see it now? Can you see my screen now? It says you have started. Yes, now I see it. Okay. So yeah, here's a, a, a picture of one of my colleagues in Antarctica, and uh, he's upside down. It's just a joke he's playing because we're on the bottom of the world here. So we're really right at the, at the South Pole, so at the bottom of the Earth. So this is the place we travel to, to study how our climate is changing. And so if we want to understand the, the climate today, we can just take a measurement. For example, if, if you want to know the temperature, we can just use a thermometer. Right? You go outside, you have your thermometer, and you can see exactly how warm it is. And so scientists have been taking measurements of temperature since the 1850s or so. And so this, this graph that I'm showing here is through time how our temperatures have changed. And as most of you probably know, our climate has been warming. So since 1880 or so, you see we have been warming by about uh, close to one degree Celsius, which is close to two degrees of Fahrenheit. This is just simple measurements, simple thermometers. So today we know exactly how the temperature is changing. We can do the same, for example, for the concentration of CO2. As most of you probably know, uh, CO2 or carbon dioxide is a gas that is increasing in the atmosphere. And the reason is that we are using fossil fuels. Every time we burn fossil fuels, the, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere goes up. And we have been taking measurements of this since about 1957. And so the graph that I show here is the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere since about 1957 on the left to today on the right. And as you can see, CO2 concentrations have been going up in time. Yeah. And so then the question becomes, what happened before that? What happened before there were scientists and researchers to do these kind of measurements? 
And so this is the kind of question. Your map, your your slide's a little half cut off. Could you exit it out and reopen it? The slide's okay. going to be for the screen. It's, okay. So is it better this way? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. This is, okay. So was the was the previous slide easy to see? No. Could you show that again? This one. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yes. So these are measurements of temperature. So if scientists want to know what the temperature is, or if you at home want to know what the temperature is, we can just take a measurement with a thermometer and we can find out how warm it is. And this is the, the graph that I was showing that was cut off earlier. Um, as you can see, since 1880 to today, the temperatures have been increasing on our planet. And this is called global warming. And we know this is happening because we have these measurements going back to the 1800s. Um, another, you've already heard about carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a, is a greenhouse gas or CO2 as we sometimes call it. It's a greenhouse gas in our atmosphere. And every time we burn fossil fuels, the amount of CO2 goes up. And what this graph is showing you is how CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere through time. So on the left is the first measurements that scientists took in the 1950s. And going to the right, you see time is going on and the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is increasing. So the question is, um, what happened before scientists were doing measurements? So we don't have measurements going very far back in time. So what happened before that? And so this is why uh, we study ice cores. We go to the two places, Greenland and Antarctica. And those places are so cold that the ice there never really melts. And we can use this, um, this, we can use this to reconstruct the climate. So we go to Antarctica and Greenland, as I said, and we drill these ice cores. And the oldest ice that we can find in Greenland is about 130,000 years old, extremely old ice. If we go to Antarctica, the ice is even older. In Antarctica, the oldest ice that we can find is 800,000 years, so, so close to a million years old. So what we do, we travel to the, to the middle of Antarctica, and then we drill all the way down to the bottom and collect a long stick of ice. And Antarctica is actually very thick. The ice in Antarctica is two miles thick. So when we get back home, we have a stick of ice that has a, that look, that has a diameter like that, but it's two miles long. So just think of it as an extremely long stick of ice. And we can use that stick of ice to, to look at the climate of the past. And the reason is, um, it's similar to a tree. So everybody is probably familiar with the tree rings. When you cut down a tree, every year a tree grows a little layer and you can count the number of layers to find out how old that tree is. The same thing happens in Antarctica. Um, every year it snows in Antarctica. So every year we get a layer of snow, but because it's it's so cold in Antarctica that snow never melts. And so the snow piles up and it piles up and it piles up. And every year we get a new layer of snow. And so when we drill that long stick of ice all the way to the bottom of Antarctica, we can count the layers just like in a tree and find out how old that ice is. And the oldest ice we find in Antarctica, like I said, is 800,000 years old. So there's 800,000 of those little layers of snow that are recorded or saved in Antarctica. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's what we look at. So we have these layers of extremely old ice in our ice core, and we can do measurements on this. So um, this next graph shows these two, um, these two records or these two measurements that I was talking about earlier. So here in the top, in the blue line, the blue line is the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere through time. And the time scale is on the bottom there. So the measurements start in say the 1950s to the present. And through, through that time period, we know that the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere has been increasing steadily. That's what you can see there in the blue line. Um, the bottom line, again, shows you the temperature change, right? So um, the 20th century, average temperature is that little dashed line and the red curve the little red wiggly line shows you how warm it was on earth during that year and so co2 has been going up and temperatures have also been going up so the question is what happened before we had these measurements and this is where the ice cores come in i'm going to go one or two slides back 
here it is. So here is a picture of what the ice looks like. And we're going to look at the ice later. And as you can see, there are little bubbles of air inside the ice. And those little bubbles trap the air that is a million years old. So if that piece of ice is a million years old, the bubbles inside of it are also a million years old. So we can look at how much CO2 there was in the atmosphere a million years ago. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay, so now let's look, look again at this graph. So the, the blue line here, the blue line is the concentration of CO2 in our measurements in the atmosphere. And now I'm gonna add this green line here. These are the, this is the concentration of CO2 that we measure inside the bubbles of these ice cores, right? As you can see, they match perfectly. So we can compare the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and the CO2 concentration in the bubbles. And as you can see, they perfectly overlap. And what this means, we can use these little bubbles to reconstruct the concentration of CO2 way back in time. 800,000 years, yeah? So let's look at what it looks like. So this is what it's like today. Now let's look at the long-term changes. So here is a really complicated graph. So let's talk about it for a little bit. On the bottom is the time, right? So all the way on the left is the age, and, and this is in thousands of years before present. So all the way on the left, we have 800,000 years ago. All the way on the right is where we are today. The green line shows you the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere. And the bottom line shows you the temperature in Antarctica, which is something we can also uh, learn from the ice. We can study the ice and find out how cold it was in Antarctica. And so what you can see is that over the last million years, our climate has always been changing. And so um, you've probably heard of these changes. We call them the ice ages. And so right now, our climate is Nice, nice and warm, but if we go just maybe 20,000 years back in time, our climate was a lot colder and we were in the middle of an ice age. And most of North America and the United States were covered in an enormous piece of ice. And so as you can see, with these ice ages, the concentration of CO2 is always going up and down. When we have a warm climate on Earth, the concentration of CO2 is high. When it's cold on Earth during an ice age, the concentration of CO2 is low. And so this is the natural, uh, the natural rhythm of our planet. We're going in and out and in and out of the ice ages. These are the ice age cycles. And those have been going on for millions of years. Let's look at what's happening today. This is where we are today. So the natural cycle of the ice age, in and out and in and out of the ice ages, is what has been happening for the last million years. But as you can see, right now, there's something very unusual going on. What's happening right now is that humans, because of all our industrial activity, because we drive cars, because we have factories, because we make electricity, because of all these reasons, we humans are producing a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of CO2. And so what is happening is that the concentration of CO2 is much higher than it has ever been during the last million years. So we can use the ice core to tell us something about how unusual our current situation is. And what the ice core is telling us, this has not happened before in the last million years. The CO2 concentration right now is extremely high and humans like us are to blame. And we know if CO2 goes up, as you can see in this graph, when CO2 is high, it's also warm on earth. So what we're gonna need to do is to limit our emissions. Every time we emit CO2, we're making the world a little bit warmer through the greenhouse effect. So um, the, the leaders of the world have agreed to limit our emissions of greenhouse gases. And so what we have to do is change to different sources of energy. We're gonna have to use wind power, solar power, and all these kind of alternative energy sources to make sure that we keep our planets cool enough for life to, to survive. Okay, this is all I had to say. Um, are there any questions now or shall we go down to the freezer first? Gina, what do you think? Let's go down to the freezer first. So if anyone has any questions, I want you to type them into me into the chat box. So okay. if you'll see on the bottom, you'll see that there's a chat. 
Um, so type them in there and then I will, you know, call on your school. I'll say, you know, oh, I see there's a, a question from Sac Village. Will you come on up to the webcam and ask your question? And that's how we'll facilitate the Q&A. So, so while you're transitioning and if you have any questions that come up, uh, write them in that chat box. Okay. Sounds excellent. That went really quick. It's only five past 10. Okay. Okay, I'll be walking down. Hopefully, we'll keep the connection. So while you're while you're talking, we do have a question from Jason Fricker. Um, Jason, I will unmute you. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, um, I've always been curious how we're able to measure temperatures 800,000 years ago. I understand CO2 trapped in the bubble, but how do you measure temperature if it's all cold all the time? How, how we, the, the temperature. Correct, how do we measure temperature? How can oh, you report temperature from a half a million years ago, for example? Yeah, that's a really good question. And so the way we do it, uh, I'm walking down to the basement right now. I hope you can still hear me. The way we do it is by measuring the so-called isotopes of water. And so there are different um, isotopes of water and they have a slightly different weight. So they are chemically identical, but they have slightly different weights. And um, the ratio of the heavy to light isotopes tells us something about temperature in the ice. And so it's, um, it's a bit of a complicated story, but it's really uh, well understood in terms of the theory behind it, that we can use the water isotopes to reconstruct the temperature of the site. Okay. Thank you. Did, did that answer your question? Well enough, yes, thanks. Yeah, okay. Well, here it is. Here's our freezer. I'm gonna put on some warm clothes. Okay. How cold is the freezer, Christo? Okay, the freezer is about minus 15 Fahrenheit. So it's pretty cold in there. Yeah, get layered up. <laughs> okay. So about how much time, how much time do you spend in the freezer? Like oh, too much, <laughs> too much time. <laughs> no, we spent, um, when we do, um, when we do measurements every day, we spend maybe an hour a day in the freezer cutting the ice. And I will show you how we do that. And so we wear warm clothes, but then also we wear these special protective gloves. And so we wear those to make sure that we do not contaminate the ice. So by touching the ice, we can, we can contaminate it. So we're wearing these gloves like your doctor may wear in the office. And we wear these gloves to protect the ice so we don't get bacteria and germs and all kinds of dust on them. Mm -hmm. That actually relates to a question we got in the chat box right now, which is how are you able to extract the ice without damaging the sample? Without damaging the sample? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, I'll show you. We can just, um, ice is a really easy material to cut. We can just cut it with a saw. And when we drill it, the sample is, is big enough that we, we don't damage it. And so the bubbles, as you'll see, are extremely small. And so if we just drill a normal ice core, we don't damage the bubbles. Great. Yeah, are we ready? Oh yeah, let's go. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, everybody, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, I can, the, the cooling is really loud, so I cannot hear you. That's okay. Here we'll we are just... inside the freezer. It's minus 25. It's really cold in here. And so these are the boxes that are full of the ice core samples. And I have a little sample right here. This is a piece of ice from Greenland. And this piece of ice is 5,000 years old. That means this piece is older than the pyramids. So the pyramids in Egypt were not yet built when this ice was falling as snow in Greenland. Isn't that exciting? So the first thing I'm gonna do is cut the ice in the saw. You see? 
Mm -hmm. This is our saw. This is where we cut the ice samples. So I cut the sample and now it's small enough to fit inside this flask. As you can see, we fit the sample inside this flask and then we can go do the measurements. Okay, I am ready to get out of the freezer because it's really cold in here, so let's go. Ah. Uh. Oh. Okay. Oh, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> what a relief, yeah. So here I have a little flask with a sample inside. And so these, I put it here in a little cup. Hopefully we can see the bubbles inside of it. Yeah, we'll have to let it, We'll have to let it melt for a minute. And once it melts a little bit, it's, it's possible to see the little bubbles inside. Okay, I'm gonna take off my cold clothes. And then we're gonna go to the lab where we're gonna do the measurements. While you're taking off your cold clothes, we have a question from Kathleen Dwyer can, uh, about greenhouse gases. Do you guys wanna come up to the mic and ask your question? <laughs> Me. Oh, okay. Okay. Guys, Wood. Okay. Hello, my name's Emma, and I was just wondering: Are greenhouse gases always harmful? Excuse me. Oh, I couldn't hear your question very well. Are greenhouse gases always harmful. Always harmful? No, they're not. Good question. Yeah. So the question is: Are greenhouse gases always harmful? And the answer is no, they're not. And if there were no greenhouse gases on Earth it would be too cool here, too cold here to live. So we need a little bit of greenhouse gases to keep the, 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 the earth warm enough to live, but we can overdo it. So this is too much of a good thing. So a little bit of greenhouse gases is really nice. Otherwise it gets too cold. But what we're doing now is putting too much greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like chocolate cake. A little bit of chocolate cake is really nice, but if you eat too much of it, it's not very good for you. <laughs> Say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> They're questionable. <laughs> okay. If there's no other questions, let's just go to the lab first. Oh. I'll try to do this with my foot. <laughs> oh, we do have a question from somebody. Um, Sack Village, will you come on up and ask your question about the ice? Hey, Sack Village, how are you doing? <laughs> you already answered my question. Oh, I already did? Yeah. Okay, do you have another question? No? Okay, that's all right. If you have another question, let us know. Okay, so here we are. This is the lab. Okay. okay, as you can see, we have a lot of different bottles in our lab. Those are all bottles with gas in them. And those are gases that we use to do our measurements. Okay, so here we are. This is where we do our different measurements. And so, like I said, here is the little flask. What we're gonna do, we put the ice inside of this flask. Okay? And then what we will, we will mount it here in this rack. And then we will pump out all the air. And so that's why it's in this special container. And so what we do is we pump out all the air that's in there 
because that air is just air from our lab. So it's not the old air that we are interested in. It is the, the lab air. And so we first pump away all the lab air, then we melt the sample. And as we melt the sample, the air comes out of the little bubbles. Once the air is out of the bubbles, we can measure the air that's inside those bubbles. Does that make sense? Okay, so the ice has gotten a little bit warmer and now we can see the different bubbles in there. So if you look very carefully, can you see the bubbles? Yeah, so these bubbles, this ice is 5,000 years old from the time of the pyramids. And so these bubbles are also 5,000 years old. So these bubbles, this is the air that the, the Pharaoh of Egypt was breathing back in the day when they were building the pyramids. There it is, the little bubbles of old air. Okay, so this is where we do the measurements. So this is the machine that we use. And this is the machine that does the measurements. So we measure the, we, we take the air out of the bubbles and then we shoot the air into this machine. And this machine can tell us exactly how much greenhouse gases are in the air samples. Yeah, Does that makes sense. Okay. Um, this is all I wanted to show you. So I suggest I'll just go back to my office. It's easier to hear you there. And then we have another 20 minutes to answer any questions you may have. Awesome. Is that all right? Yeah, is that's that great. Plan? Yeah, we have a bunch of questions. Great, a bunch of questions. Yeah, so all kinds of questions are welcome. So you can talk about um, the science, but I've been to Antarctica two times and to Greenland two times. So if you have any questions about what it's like to spend time in Greenland, you're welcome to ask those questions too. Awesome, great. While you're walking, I'd love for you to just talk about how you got into this field. So how yeah. did you, what was your trajectory that got you to where you are today? Okay, that's a good question. So um, I started studying physics actually. So my background is in, Ooh. I did my um, physics degree. I actually was a teacher for a little while school teacher for one year mm -hmm. get to school and get a degree and I found in the on the internet I found a ad saying scientists wanted for exp for exp uh, for an um, expedition to Greenland so I signed up <laughs> so that's the reason yeah that's great um, what, what classes would you should suggest that, so if someone's interested in pursuing like the science that you're doing, yeah. uh, what, uh, majors or classes or experience would you suggest for, you know, folks in middle school or high school to pursue? Yeah. So, um, so this is all natural sciences. So anything, so when it comes to ice cores, there are many different people working together. And so we often have people that are, um, um, with experience in, experience in physics, geologists, so people from all kinds of backgrounds. And so <clears throat> if you're interested in doing this kind of work, um, yeah, classes like that, just anything that's related to the science of our Earth, so geology, um, but also biology. Some people study the, the microorganisms, there's little bacteria that live inside the ice, and some people study those. Some people study volcanic eruptions. So anytime there's a volcano, ash lands on the ice sheet and so some people study 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 that some people study the volcanic layers so there's a lot of different people who work on ice cores with many different backgrounds cool i'm going to open it up to some of our classrooms i see we have a few questions from melissa sleeper so i'm going to unmute your microphone and will you all ask your questions Go ahead, Drew. oh um what is the best way to prevent Level That's a really good question. The best way, yeah. Uh, the best way, I think, is for governments of the world to make strong agreements and come up with good solutions. So there's um, both we as citizens have a responsibility. So every time, you know, every time you leave the house, turn off the lights. If you can take your bike instead of your car, take your bike. So we have a responsibility to limit our greenhouse emissions, 
this problem is a really large problem. And I think all the governments of the world need to work together to solve this problem. And so our responsibility as citizens is to vote for politicians who will support climate change action. Great. We have another question from that same classroom. Go oh. ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, like the small things like riding your bike or turning your lights off, is that going to stop greenhouse, greenhouse gas completely or that's going to limit it? Because and not everybody's going to do that. And yeah. um, is, there larger, is there a way to do it on a larger scale? Yeah. yeah. I think that's a good question. And uh, I agree with you if we all, so we, we should all try to limit our, our emissions, but that alone is not gonna solve the whole problem. And so it is much more important that governments, national governments across the world take strong action to make sure that the, the energy infrastructure in the countries is changing. So we need to change on a, a, on a large scale, on the national scale, we need to move away from coal-fired power plants to more sustainable alternatives. Yeah. So no, it's it's bigger than us. It's bigger than us just switching, you know, making sure we are safe with our energy. But at the same time, we have to save energy too. So it's you know, a bit of both, I think. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Oh, we see thumbs up. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah. Great. We have another question from uh sack village let me unmute you guys all right go ahead ask your question hey sack village hello can you hear me yes i can hear you okay all right so my first question is what type of bacteria slash organisms are found in the ice oh that's a good question so what we find are mostly um well, let me say this one first. There's actually almost nothing inside this ice. This is the cleanest water in the world because we're so far away from land. Antarctica is Antarctica and Greenland both are so far away from land that there's almost nothing in this ice. There's almost no dust in it. There's almost no bacteria in it. It's extremely clean. So when we find bacteria, there's just a few of them. And so um, you won't find coronavirus in this virus, in this ice. <laughs> so it's, it's um, the bacteria that we find are typically, um, so, some of them are blown in by the wind. So what can happen is that the wind just picks up bacteria and dust from the land and then blows it to Antarctica or Greenland and then it falls on the ice. And that's where we find it. People have also found, and this is fascinating, people have found little bacteria that can actually live inside the ice. So some bacteria are still alive at these temperatures and it's minus 15 or minus 20 degrees. So it's really cold. And some of these bacteria still manage to stay alive at those temperatures, which is quite, quite amazing, I think. Oh, wow. All right, thank you. Uh, I also have an, another question. Mm -hmm. Go for it. How big of a sample of ice do you need to do proper measurements? Of those? That's a, yeah, that's a really good question also. Um, so it depends what kind of measurement you're trying to do. So some measurements are really easy and we only need a very small sample. Some, some measurements are really hard and we're gonna need maybe two pounds of ice. And so the measurements I was showing you today, this is how big our sample is. So this is maybe, this is maybe uh, three ounces, two or three ounces of ice. This is all we need to measure uh, for measuring greenhouse gases, concentrations of greenhouse gases. In some cases though, we only need you know, maybe, maybe, you know, there's a little piece like that. In other cases, I was involved in one study where every sample was a thousand pounds of ice. So we had to have extremely big samples because that measurement was just extremely difficult. So, it, so it's, a, it's a really good question. So for every different kind of measurement we want to make, we have a different size of ice sample. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, okay, so I have another one. <laughs> okay, we have a lot of questions. That's great. <laughs> How deep do you need to go into the ice to obtain a sample like yeah yeah 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, so it depends how old you want the ice. So this sample, like I was saying, the ice that we have here from Greenland is this, this sample came from 600 meters deep. That is um, about 1800 feet deep below the surface. And this is 5,000 years old. So if you want, um, the deeper you go, the older the ice. So if you want a sample that is maybe only 10 years old, you only have to go down you know, 10 feet or so. If you want a sample that's 800,000 years old, you need to go down two miles all the way to the bottom. So the old ice is at the bottom and the really young ice is at the top. And in between is everything else. And so depending on what you're interested in, you have to go deeper or shallower. All right, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Cool. All right, we have some additional questions from Melissa Sleeper's classroom. I'm gonna unmute you, come on up and ask. Okay. Oh, Owen? Okay. Do you find any gases that aren't CO2 in the ice? The sound is- Come closer. Louder, Owen. Sorry. He's coming closer. Yeah, a little yeah. bit louder. We couldn't quite hear you. Are there any gases other than carbon dioxide in the ice samples? That's a very good Yeah, that's a good question. So um, what we find in these ice samples is all the gases that are also in the air today. And so if you look at the air today, if you were to study the air today, you'll find that most of it is nitrogen. Almost 80% of it is nitrogen. Almost 20% of it is oxygen. And then there's some other gases like argon and like xenon, noble gases, we call those. And so all the gases that we have today are also inside the ice. So CO2 is only one of many gases. And so all the same gases are, that we find today are in the bubbles. So the thing that changes is the concentration of uh, CO2. And so we measure that in parts per million. That means, so today it's around 410 parts per million. That means if you take 1 million molecules of our atmosphere, 410 of those molecules are going to be CO2 molecules. If you go all the way back to the ice age, when the world was really cold, there was only 180 parts per million. So out of every million molecules, only 180 of those were CO2. So that's CO2 concentration changes in the atmosphere. With other gases, for example, nitrogen, the amount of nitrogen doesn't change. So in this ice, we have the exact same amount of nitrogen that you are breathing in today. Great. And, um, sorry. <laughs> we have uh, one more question from that classroom as well. So okay. go ahead, ask away. Yeah, ask away. Um, that was your question, Liliana. Wow, please. Oh, wait. What did the researchers do to reduce their footprint and pollution while on the ice researching? What do we do? To reduce your footprint and pollution on the ice when That's you're there. That's a very good question, yeah. And so it, so it depends a little bit where you are. So some places in Antarctica are extremely protected. And so that means that every drop of water that you touch has to be flown out. And so I was staying in a place called the Dry Valleys in Antarctica, which are really strongly protected. And that means that you could not take a shower because every drop of water that touches your body has to be taken out with a helicopter. And so in that case, we had to pee in a special bottle and put it in a bucket. And then the bucket was flown out with a helicopter to protect Antarctica. And so um, everything we touch, everything we do has to be uh, flown back to Antarctica just to make sure that we're not polluting Antarctica in that, in that location. In other places, um, other places, for example, in Greenland, the, the rules are not so strict. And so in Greenland, to make a toilet, we can just dig a hole and use that for a toilet. Great. We have a question from T Quali One. Let's see. Can you ask your question? You've been unmuted. I'll ask it. Great. What's <laughs> what's yeah. the oldest sample that you have? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So the oldest ice. I was saying the oldest ice that has been found in Antarctica was eight hundred thousand years. But that's the oldest ice that we have found in one long stick. 
there are some really special places in Antarctica where the old ice just comes to the surface by itself. And so those places, we have found ice that we think is 2.4 million years old. 2.4 million, so really old ice. But that is really that ice is really hard to find and we can only find a little bit of it. And so that ice is both really old, but also much harder to interpret because it's in this special location and not in one of the long sticks. So the, the, the long ice cores are simple because the young ice is at the top and the old ice is at the bottom. These special places where the ice just comes to the surface, it's all mixed up. So you'll have old ice next to young ice next to old ice. So that ice is really hard to interpret, but it's also really old. So the oldest ice that we have in our freezer here is 2.4 million years old. Wow, that's mm -hmm. so old. Yeah, it's so <laughs> I've never touched it. <laughs> Do you need like special clearance to touch ice that old? Um, no, you don't. No, that ice is, um, you don't need special clearance. You just, um, need, yeah, if you, if, you don't, if you have no reason to touch it, you just shouldn't touch it because sure. it's so special, because it's so special. It's really hard to find ice this old. So ice that's 5,000 years old, we have a lot of that ice. And so that's why I can use it to show you today. But when it comes to ice that is really old, it is so rare that we, you know, we, 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 don't, uh, we don't just touch it for no reason. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. All right. We have another question from Kathleen Dwyer's classroom. You want to come on up and ask your question? You have been unmuted. At least I think I've unmuted you. Hey. Yep, there you go. So go we, ahead, wanted, ask away. we were looking at that graph that showed the steep increase in carbon dioxide in temperature, yeah. which is a little daunting. Uh, do you think mm -hmm. that trend can be reversed? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, of course it can be reversed. We just have to try hard. And so um, the, the moment we reduce our emissions, the curve is gonna flatten out. And so if we can stop our emissions soon, the curve is gonna, is gonna flatten out. And so there are different scenarios. So uh, researchers have different scenarios for the future. And for some of those scenarios, the line flattens out as early as 20 years or 30 years from now, as long as we make sure that we are taking the right measures to make sure that we're not emitting more CO2. If we do nothing, yes, the, the curve will keep going up, of course. If we don't change our behavior and we keep emitting a lot of CO2, the curve will keep going up. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We have another question from Sack Village. Go ahead and uh, ask your question. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, my question is, if hypothetically you can sell the ice for monetary value, what would be the worth of a sample? <laughs> That's a really good question. Oh, I don't know. I was always thinking about this. What if I go to a really expensive cocktail bar in New York City and I tell them that this is 5,000 years old and you can put it in your drink. How much would people pay for it? I don't know. <laughs> no, um, it's really hard. It's really hard to put a value on it. And so um, this ice is all. Get, this, this, these cores are drilled by large international teams, and so it's it's a lot of work to drill an ice core. It takes usually, in terms of preparation and the actual work, it takes about ten years to drill all the way to the bottom. And so that includes um, we have to go to Antarctica. We have to employ all the drillers and the researchers to work on it. We have to have food and fuel in the camp. And so when you think about the total cost of an ice core, it's probably a few million dollars. And so one sample is really valuable. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. We have um, a couple of questions um, that I'll, I'm just going to read. But yeah. it's, uh, if the question, how long have you been researching ice um, and what made you interested in it? Yeah, so I've been researching ice for 10 years now. And uh, like I said, I think we talked about this earlier a little bit. Gina asked my, about how I got into this. And the reason I got into it because I found this ad where they were asking for graduate students who were interested in taking a scientific expedition to Greenland. So that's the, my, one of my reasons for getting into it because I was really excited to have the opportunity to do research in the polar regions because I had never visited and I was very excited and curious to see what it was like. Cool. 
Um, we have a class from, or a question from Mr. Curry's class. So I'm gonna unmute you and will you ask your question? Can you use the gases trapped in the ice, like carbon dioxide or nitrogen? Can we use them for anything? Yeah, so what, the, what we use them for mostly is just doing measurements. And so we take measurements of the gases to find out how they changed in the past. And we haven't really found any other use for them yet. So the only thing we use them for is just for doing research, for trying to figure out how our climate works, how our planet works. Great. And then I think we have one more question from Sack Village. So I will unmute you and you guys can go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Okay. I'll just say it. Do you have specific sites where you get your ice samples? Specific sites? Yeah. Not like websites, but like, um, locations locations yes there you go yeah yeah so we um yeah so we go to greenland and antarctica and we like to go to places where the ice flow is pretty simple and so what happens if you're in the middle of antarctica there's a lot of snowfall and it's so cold that it never melts but that ice is not always in the same place it flows almost like a river but it flows very slowly so when you look at it you cannot see it but it is flowing so the ice falls, the snow falls in the middle of Antarctica, and then it flows to the sides. And where we like to drill, the location we like to drill is right in the middle, because there, the ice flow is really simple. If you go in the edge, the ice flow is really complicated, and it makes it very difficult to, to work with the ice. And so that's why we try to go to places where it's simple. The ice flow is very simple, and that way we can, um, we ma it makes it a lot easier to do our work. So yeah, very good question. We have to go, we have to be very careful where we go. And before we drill an ice core, we also make uh, radar measurements of what the bottom of the ice looks like. So the ice is two miles thick, but underneath the ice, there's a complete landscape. So there can be mountains under the ice, or it can be just flat parts under the ice. And we typically like to go to flat places. So we try to look for a place where the ice flow is very simple and where the, 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 the rock underneath the ice is nice and flat. So the ice doesn't just slide off to the side or something like that. Oh, okay. Thank Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's a whole world underneath the ice. And by doing these measurements, people have found um, a canyon that's larger than the Grand Canyon underneath the Greenland ice sheet, just hidden there. Well, this is going to be our last question from okay, one more wires classroom. Go ahead, ask your question. Hi. What's the most dangerous part of your job? Oh, that's a good question. The most dangerous part of my job. Um, well, I think the probably the most dangerous thing is when we go to Antarctica or Greenland on expeditions because Antarctica is not only the coldest place in the world, it also has the worst weather. And so what can happen is that you're in your camp and one day the weather is nice, you have blue skies and, it's, um, and it's, it's pleasant to be there. And the next day the wind can pick up and it can be the strongest wind you've ever had. And so sometimes um, what happens is that we are trapped in our camp for, for days with really bad weather, really strong winds. And the biggest risk is that if you go outside during those times, they're, um, they're, they're called whiteout conditions. And so what happens, the winds are so strong and they're blowing so much snow that you cannot see anything. So if you go outside, any direction you look, it just looks white. You look up, it's white. You look down, it's white. Everywhere you look. So you cannot see the sky. You cannot see anything more than, say, um, anything more than three feet away is completely invisible. And so it's very dangerous to go outside in those conditions because you can get lost. And if, if you walk in the wrong direction, there's nothing there. And so then you have to just wait it out outside in the cold and the snow. So that's probably the most dangerous part is that the weather in Antarctica is really unpredictable and can be extremely dangerous. Thank you. 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 Yeah. So thank you everyone for joining us. And before we head out, I just want to let you know that if you 
thought this presentation was really interesting and you want to know a little bit more about Christo's work and see a virtual tour of his lab, um, you can play the Nova Polar Lab. So if you go to pbs.org slash Nova slash labs, you'll see the Polar Lab right on top. And it's an opportunity for you to actually interact with the ice cores that Christo was talking about. So you'll get a chance to count some carbon dioxide, um, do some mathematics to determine to see how CO2 has changed over different periods of time. And then, um, and then you'll uh, also meet some other scientists at different, uh, studying different pieces of the Arctic or the Antarctic. So you can travel to Ellesmere Island to look at fossils. You can uh, study mud cores from an ancient lake in Russia to learn about uh, different pollen counts. So we just look about temperature. And then you can also study seals in Antarctica to learn about how our changing climate is impacting animals um, in the southernmost part of the world. So if this is something that sounds fun to you, this is free and accessible, and you can learn more about Christo's work, it's at pbs.org slash nova slash labs. And I'll be sure to send a follow-up email to all of your teachers um, with all that information. And it's for free and whenever you wanna access it. So if we could, once again, thank Christo for joining us. This was great. I, I see lots of, you know, raising the roofs and high fives and, and everything. So that's great. Um, thank you for joining us, Christo. Um, yeah, this is fantastic. Asking. And classrooms, thanks for coming and visiting with yeah. us. We have about two more virtual field trips in this series. So um, stay tuned. We'll be broadcasting more. And thanks for joining us. Have a good day. Have a good thanks weekend. For hey, thanks bye. for hosting GM. Thanks for all your questions, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.